The thing that you said earlier that, that that seems to me so core, so central to all all of the stuff that I you know, I've read from you and and heard you talk about really is this idea of making this pro process in small steps. And so you know, the smaller the steps, the better. There's a I was watching one of your conference presentations and 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 you you were saying about the early days of. Um, uh, thinking about work you know working in small steps you say oh you know if if we could if we could get this to a state where we could you know we we could we could do, you know uh, create something every month that would be great you know if we did all the design in a month and then and if we did it for a couple of weeks and then if we did it for a week and then if we did it every day <laughs> and you're just bringing that time down and you know and at each stage your design got simpler at, at each stage it's right. easier to understand and at each stage you're getting you know, more insight into what's really going on. Well, all, all development is incremental. Yes. It, it, if you have a, a thousand developers working on a system and you only release once a year, this is, a, you know, back in the bad old days, yeah. it was still incremental. It, you could, if you had the a godlike view of all of that activity, one line of code was being written at, being finished at a time. You know, yeah. if you had sufficiently fine grained timestamps, you could you could linearize you linearize all the lines of code ever written by a thousand people in a year. It's just that the feedback wasn't incremental. Yes. And so the question is, <clears throat> how closely do you want to match the feedback cycle to the to the changes? And yes. queuing theory suggests that your your sensing loop and your controlling loop should be about the same size. Yeah. So if you're changing code every 10 seconds, if you have a new line of code every 10 seconds, yeah. having feedback every 10 seconds would be would be ideal. That's yeah. that's the best you can get. Yes. And yeah, for lots of reasons people resist that, but um as far as I'm concerned, we're not done until we get there. This is the, I, I call this limbo because the limbo song asks, how low can you go? Yeah. So this is how quickly can we, we make the deployment cycle? Yeah. And uh, uh, I think there's a long ways to go. This is another one of these ideas that's probably 20 years ahead of its time, but uh, that's okay. You know, if people want to, um, if you, if people want, to experiment with this, they could experiment with it today. Yeah, yeah, and and you know you you get into you know from from you know, the stuff that, that that I talk about, you know, ideas like organizing for continuous delivery, continuous deployment, so that you can you can exercise that all the way into production, and you can you, you can just keep your eye. And as you say, everything starts to get simpler as that batch size, that that size of change reduces because. Each change gets simpler and easier to reason about, easier to test, easier to isolate. You're controlling the variables. If I make this change and you make that change, which one is it that increased, you know, customer sign up? How do we tell? Well, if we release them one at a time, we can tell. You know, it's it, everything becomes simpler when we go that way. I, I, I guess the thing that doesn't, the challenge that people face, which I, I assume is you know, from what I've read of, of on your site of, about your your new book books, is is that the, the thing that doesn't really get simpler for many people is this idea of incremental design. That seems very natural to me over time. I, I, the way that you talk about it, it seems very natural. Um, do you think that that's an inherently difficult thing, or do you think that that's a thing that you know we learn stuff the wrong way, and and so and so it's. You know, it's difficult to 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 change horses, or 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 is it is it just that you and me are weird? Well, that's certainly true. <laughs> I'm just not sure that that's relevant to the this conversation. So I call this the salami slicing problem, right? So so in that story is all of software product development, as far as I'm concerned. You have you have two variables: how thin are the slices? And what order do you eat them? Yeah. I call it the succession problem. So to your question, is that a difficult problem? Partly I want to say it's an incredibly difficult problem sometimes to figure out the sequence 
that lets that that maximizes feedback, that maximizes learning. Yeah, that can be a, an incredible challenge. Um, and what makes it worse is that we just don't talk about it. I remember watching a, a, a highway bridges get replaced. Uh, the the freeway that I I had to drive on a regular basis. So they built a temporary bridge. Let's see, what was the, they were actually replacing two bridges at the same time at like uh, five kilometers apart. And, and the sequence was completely different because where they were one, in one case, they built a temporary bridge kind of in between the two bridges. And then they replaced one of them and then they replaced the other one. And then they took the temporary bridge out. Mm -hmm. But in the other one, they were more constrained with the space. And so they had to have both had to have traffic move to one bridge both ways, you know, reduced to one lane each way. Yeah. And then they replaced the other bridge and then they moved the traffic to. So somebody had to think about that. None of that is strength of materials. None of that has yeah. to do with the shape of the bridge. But somebody had to think really carefully about the succession problem. What yes. order are we going to do? What activities? so that we end up where we want to be. I think the the part of the difficulty in software is we just don't talk about that succession problem. We don't give it the same weight as we give to the descriptions of the structure. So we'll talk about design patterns. Here's a here's a kind of microstructure that reappears over and over again that solves certain problems that reappear over and over again. But we don't talk about succession. We don't say, all right, you have five lines of code to write, and you think the only way to do it is to write line one, two, three, four, five. That's four fingers and five lines of code. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> all the OCD people are going to be <laughs> tripping out. Sorry. I apologize. Uh, so, But that's not necessarily the order in which, the only order in which you can write those lines of code. Because yeah. maybe you can write line four, feed a constant into it, and then double check to make sure that, that you're getting the same answer as you used to get. And that, 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 that you have n factorial ways yeah. of writing n lines of code. And we, we don't explore beyond one sequence. And so I, I think if we if we made that a topic of conversation, if we started paying more attention to, oh, you know, here's a really cool way that you can write this before you write that, you might think that, yeah, but no, in fact, I, I think we'll we'll learn a lot about it. And there's tremendous value to be unlocked in exploring more of the space of those n factorial sequences. Uh, but yeah, currently we're just not doing it. So I think it is a really hard problem. It's to me, it's far more satisfying. Yeah. So, the, 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 so the, there were a couple of things that were going through my head as you were describing that. One of them is, you know, the, the, there are lots of different solutions to that problem and <clears throat> it depends what you're optimizing for, which, you know, right. and I, it seems to me that often, Particularly more junior teams, but 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 you know some teams seem to struggle with the notion that there's one right answer sometimes to to, to yes. be able to, to be able to get to a solution, and there's never one right answer. There, there's always lots of different ways that we can go about it. And the other thing that was going through my hand, head as as you were describing that, that's that's kind of a follow-on thought from that is. <clears throat> I think one of the things that I recognise in myself, at least, is that I am now completely comfortable starting on something where I don't know what the end is. I, I, right. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I've got confidence that I don't know what the end is, but I know how to get there. Right. <laughs> and, but, and, and you get there by iterating, iterating and experimenting and figuring out what your fitness function is that sees where you're closer to the destination or further away and all of those kinds of things. And all of the stuff that you talk, you know, talk, talk to, have talked about over the years seems to help us to be able to do that and, make this progress in small chunks you know once again and so but, I, but that I confidence I'm not, I'm not quite sure whether it's the confidence or or, or or not you know maybe i'm overconfident but but i think that just having having the the feeling of being able to start 
when you don't know where the end point is. Well, I think that's the, isn't that what uh, any engineering is like, really. What you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's just acknowledging the reality of the situation. Yes, I, I think there's a there's a stage where you don't know how to write a program, and then you figure out a way to write a program, and then you think, oh, okay, so so there's one way, and I and don't don't confuse me with the alternatives, because, like, if I started thinking about the alternatives then uh, I'm going to lose the confidence that I can do anything. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But then eventually you realize, oh, no, it's okay. I, yeah, there's, there's lots of sequences that could, could result in the same thing. And I know one, let's find some more. This is why I love programming the same thing over and over again. Yes. Um the the tdd book has this multi-currency money example and i probably started that from scratch in i probably maybe 10 different programming languages and 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 built it all up from scratch 30 times and like it was time number 28 and i found a completely new approach to it that's the kind of thing i love playing with all right yeah. so I know I've got 10 test cases that have to pass. What order should I cause? Should I address them? I don't know. Let me try it. Let me try. I'll start with this one or I'll start with that one. I'll start, and different reasons would cause me to move certain of those test cases earlier in the sequence or later in the sequence. Part of the learning process is learning to sniff out. All right. Well, which test is going to teach me the most? Yeah. Well, that's also going to change depending on what you already know. Yes. So let's let's try shuffling the deck, having the test come out in a different order and seeing what that does to our process, to our feelings, to our progress, to the finished product. I don't know. It, which, it's, which, it's which, unpredictable. which gets us really back to what we were talking about before about this being a discipline of learning and and you know the, the, you know we need the tools of exploration really to to explore and play with ideas and figure out you know where we are and where we're going that's any you know any given point yeah and i think it's that it's that when i'm talking uh, a teaching or coaching a, a kind of journeyman program or somebody yeah. who can get a program to behave a certain way, but maybe only has one one path to get there. That that re reimplementation is such a powerful technique because it's clearly a waste of time. Yeah, uh, the program's there and it works. Who cares? Yeah, we're not we're not asking whether we can do that. We know that we can get a program to behave in a certain way. Yeah, big deal. Let's let's open the space up of the ways we can get from here to there. And some of them will be better and some of them will be worse, but consciously shaping the unfolding of the program yes. as opposed to just consciously shaping the program itself, th that gives you so many more options for what and, you can and, do. And, so, and, and, yeah. and valuing the, the, the structures that we create and the, you know, the, the shapes that we're building in the software, really, the, the, the you know, the, um, I, 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 the other part of my, my engineering idea is, you know, the, the other part of our discipline is managing complexity. And we do that through tools like cohesion, coupling, abstraction, separation of concerns, and, uh, you know, and modularity and those sorts of things, which <clears throat> seems to me, you know, quite a lot of the, the meat of your new book talking about that that kind of level of ideas and so on but you know but and almost you know when i'm i'm a software guy and, and if, if you explain a problem to me i'm immediately imagining solutions and i'm always too embarrassed i'm not going to mention any of them to anybody because they're they're all way too embarrassing to start with you know th there's some kind of quality that we're going to apply to to uh, to our designs uh, uh, our solutions that we value that allow us to you know, maybe make this more incremental progress that we've been talking about and 
I, 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 one of the things that I've been saying in public for a little while now is that I'm starting to think that, you know, that the fundamental measure of quality in software is our ability to change it. You know, everything else is secondary right. to do that. You know, if you want it to, you know, you, you, of course, you want it to be secure and fast and all those sort of things, but you don't get those things if you can't change it. So optimizing to allow us to be able to change it is, you know, table stakes and i'm going to de i'm going to prefer designs that maintain my ability to change it and i don't mean over engineering i just I, yeah I just yeah, yeah yeah okay okay you knew you knew where i was where my I face did. was going with that one i did I, I i'm i'm absolutely not talking about designing for the future i'm designing absolutely for now but i'm just going to leave the door open you know if if there's a there's a seam in my code here and you know i'm talking to a database i don't want to know the detail of the database i'm just going to talk to it and i'll write a little bit of code that talks to the database and that'll be the bare minimum that i need for right now the problem that i'm facing right now but i just want to have some shapes in it and prefer those sorts of structures that are going to allow me to keep to change it keep to test it and all those sorts of things as i go forward <clears throat> Yeah, it, again, this depends on where where are we on the trade-off between yeah. we know where the value lies and we don't know where the value lies. Yes. Where, if the, the 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 predicted value and the re, uh, revealed value. Yeah. If predicted value is most of the value, and we're going to learn a little bit, then sure fine do things in big chunks because yeah you're not getting you're not going to find out anything anyway but it's just never the case the, yeah. the trade-off the the revealed value is always many sometimes many orders of magnitude greater than the predicted value yes and if you get into one of those situations and you want to take advantage of the opportunity you're completely on the side of how are we going to, how are we going to both discover and then exploit the uh, these new sources of value that we just never expected. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley, a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.